If I were to tell you the roadshow is coming to you from a palace, don't think kings, queens and corgis, but we are coming to you from the home of someone very important though. So welcome to the roadshow from the Bishop's Palace in Wales, in deepest Somerset. <laughs> to the Bishop's Palace in the city of Wales. God save the Queen. That was splendid, thank you very much. That may not be the most modern way to spread the word, but there's certainly been a great deal of anticipation here about the arrival of the roadshow. It's been at least 15 years since we last set foot in this beautiful market town in the Mendip Hills. So where would our experts start if they were appraising England's smallest city, Wales? Age. It doesn't take a scholar to realise that the heart of this place is medieval. Condition. This collection of ruins in the Bishop's Palace is remarkably intact, having survived wars and rash redevelopments. And rarity? Well, the ecclesiastical quarter particularly is unique. It's the most historic backdrop we've visited this season, with a whole city of medieval ecclesiastical buildings. There are a series of gateways which at one time shut off the religious quarter from the rest of the city, and they've all got great names. The Dean's Eye guides us here onto the Cathedral Green. Chain Gate takes us to the oldest continually inhabited street in Europe, Vickers Close. Worryingly, for those about to receive their valuations, this is known as Penniless Port. Let's hope it doesn't jinx those passing through it on their way to the roadshow, where our experts are already chomping at the bit in anticipation of another great day. So this is um, been described by you as your African Violet Bowl? African Violet Bowl, uh, yep. But why? My mother-in-law, who owned it before me, had an African Violet pot plant stood in it for nearly 20 years. And the reason that she stood African violets in it was because the flowers and the petals would cover up the topless ladies. Oh, I see. So it was... It was a bit rude. It was considered as, um, as a bit risque. Yes. Um, I've always loved this bowl, and, and I've owned very few pieces by this person. Now, do you know who the, who the person is that I'm relating to here? It's marked on the bottom, and um, I think it's, it's French, isn't it? It is French. I'm going to just, just come here, because let's get the... It says there, Ar Lalique, France. Mm -hmm. You come across Ar Lalique in your time? Well, I've heard you talk about him I, a lot. I, 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 yes. You'd think he was a relation. I've gone yes. about him that many times. <laughs> but... You, you can't say enough about his work because he's very, very clever. Um, uh, first of all, he's designing this piece of glass in and around about 1925 or thereabouts. Um, and he's just got this wonderful way with the female form. Uh, but have you noticed, just look at this, he gives his mermaids these sort of twin fins, if you will, twin, can you see, these twin legs? Yes. You don't get that with English mermaids, that's the French being different. And I just love the way that these bubbles are sort of incorporated into the design. And, and it's a ball. design um, which continues, or you get six of them. Um, this was um, retailed under the name of Ondine. And, um, and it uses the opalescence, and that's a technique which is basically, it's very clever, it's all to do with a chemical reaction in the glass. Now, the longer the glass takes to cool, the more opaque um, the glass is. It looks almost blue, doesn't it? It's well, got it a blue is. Tint. It's, it's, it's just such a clever design. Uh, now, now, let's look at the rim. Um, this rim actually, at some stage, has been, has been ground. 
right. um, because it should be a, just a tad higher. Um, but having said all that, um, it's still a lovely thing. So, what's it worth? What price? You've got six mermaids on there. If I was to tell you that it's worth somewhere in the region of about £800. Good God. Yeah? <laughs> Well, that works out at less than £150 a mermaid, doesn't it? You could buy quite a few African violets with that as well, couldn't you? As well? You certainly could. <laughs> but please, just give me one promise. Never, ever put African violets in it again. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> promise me. A geographical panorama exhibiting characteristic representations of the scenery and inhabitants of various regions. Uh, London published by Harvey and Darton, I can just about read their name there, Gracechurch Street, May the 20th, 1822. So this is an educational toy which represents what was happening in the world of 1822. And where did you get them from? Well, I found them at an antique fair about seven or eight years ago. Um, I love old toys. Have you got a large collection? No, not very, but I, I love sort of old children's books and, and I, if I ever do find them, I, I buy them because I'm completely mad, really. <laughs> and it takes me back to my childhood and my mother, who was always giving all our toys to the scouts when we were at school. Yes. And so ever since then, I've been trying to get things back. <laughs> yes, we should never give Boy Scouts girls toys. No. <laughs> well, like, it was all my soldiers. All your soldiers? Mm -hmm. You had soldiers? I had a coronation. You had a whole coronation, whole coronation. With, a car with a carriage Yes, as well. and she gave the whole lot away. Oh. So ever since then, I've been making up for it. I see. Now, these men here are obviously firing point-blank range at the walruses. Slaughtering the poor things. Slaughtering the poor things. Now, does that uh, remind you of anything? No. Any scenery, that remind, any picture you've ever seen before? Uh, no. Well, in fact, it comes straight out of the voyages of Captain Cook. Oh, does it? Yes, oh, absolutely. The very same right. view. How fantastic. Anyway, and you can stick on these sailors here, and they're, um, they're rather good, aren't they? Yeah, I think they're fantastic. Splendid. Let's go to the next one. Here's another one. <laughs> and this is of a ship in the Arctic. Oh. So this would represent, as indeed the war rep represents, northern climes. And then further on, these wonderful mm. dancers here. Men playing their drums, tom-toms, in a lovely tropical view. Yes. And this lovely lady in her most extraordinary crinoline. Extraordinary costume. It is. Do you think she's picking her nose? It's very likely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that too, that yes. too, all those figures and the backgrounds no. comes out in Captain Cook's voyage to the South no. Seas. Right. Now, did you pay an awful lot of money for these? Yeah. Well. I thought it was uh, fairly expensive at the time. I paid about £150. For it. £150? Yes. And there are nine pieces here. Yes, there nine, are nine views. Pieces, nine views, nine mm -hmm. set backgrounds, and you could interspace one with the other. Yes. With the Cook connection, I think mm. that they're absolutely fantastic. I think somewhere between 1500 and 2000 Oh, that was quite a nice <laughs> find, wasn't it? Oh, good. Excellent. Good. Thank you for bringing them in. Well, thank you very much. We've had it in our possession for a few years. Um, we, it was a friend's we always admired when we visited, and we sort of said, if you're ever thinking about getting rid of it, would you please give us first refusal? And that's how it's come to belong in our house. So that's it, really. That's it. <laughs> but you bought it from him? Yes. And do you remember how much you bought I it from I don't. I don't really know. I wish I did. It was a few years ago now. In a nutshell, mm -hmm. it's what every clock collector, English clock collector, wants to have in their collection. Really? It is because it's so small. That's the quintessential nugget with this clock. It's its size. Mm -hmm. But not only that, it has an ebonised fruitwood case, but it's the juxtaposition of the enamel dial and the gilt mask around the dial that just sets it off. And on top of that, we have a clockmaker by the name of Charles Haley. Yes. And here he has signed it here, up in the arch. Mm -hmm. Charles Haley was a, not a, he didn't excel in clock making in terms of that he was one of those names that stands out in lights. But whatever he made, he made very well and he made beautifully proportioned clocks. Right. And that's what we've got here. Really? The other little nugget to point out is mm -hmm. that where he's put his signature, there's a little hand and a scale 
numbered 10 to 60. Yes. Have you ever noticed that? Well, yes. I don't exactly know what it does. It does a very clever thing. It regulates the pendulum. Oh, I see. So it makes yes. the clock go faster and slower. Yes. Now, on most clocks, you have to turn the clock around and turn a nut at the bottom of the pendulum bob mm -hmm. to push it up or let it down to make it go faster or slower. Okay. On this clock, all you have to do is open the door, move the hand one way or the other, mm. and 99% of clocks don't have this facility. They don't? No. Little yeah. things, little what? things, please, Tell me more. please collectors. <laughs> little things, please collectors, I'm afraid. It's the way we are. Um, Date-wise, mm -hmm. around 1800, it is a very fashionable little timepiece. Any collector worth his salt yes. will pay between five and seven thousand pounds for it. Really? <laughs> Gosh, really? Yeah, it's a super, super Gosh. little clock. This was part of the Doulet inheritance. Uh, they discovered gold mines in Australia, and uh, this was a lump of gold or a lump of gold-bearing quartz fr from that gold mine. Th this is what it looks like when it comes out of the ground. That's exactly you actually, what it you actually like. get a pick pickaxe, you heave your pickaxe into quartz, and you yep. just hope that there's going to be enough gold in it Absolutely. To, 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 to turn you into a rich man. And did it? Not me, no. Unfortunately not. But apparently it did them. Apparently the mine was worth around about £30 million. And this was when? Uh, back in the uh, late 19th century, around about eight, 1880. This was uh, George Durham Doulet went out with his family. He was a carpenter. Uh -huh. And this was found by his son, George Philip. Right. Um, as was this uh, gentleman here. It's, uh, so George Philip is a gentleman. Uh, George Philip's sister married my grandfather, right. which is where we come into it. Now, you said that this belonged to the same man who, who took this lump out of Australia. Apparently so. This Tell me a, more about him. Um, at some time during his life, he went to Japan and uh, he worked with the Japanese government in forming and developing the newspaper business there. And this apparently was given to him as thanks from the Japanese government. Do you know the date? Uh, of this piece? Yeah. Uh, no, but I do know it's probably around about, I don't know, eight, again, 1880, possibly. 1880. I, well, that would, I don't know. That would certainly tie in with a, a, a movement that we're constantly referring to on the programme called Japanesery. Right. Up until the 1860s, Japan had been isolated from Europe, didn't want anything to do with anybody outside Japan. Yeah. And then suddenly they realise they have to modernise themselves when they come into contact with Europeans doing yeah. the sorts of things that your right. forebears were doing. Right. And, uh, and, and so it was that Japanese works of art came flooding over to Europe okay. and it caused an absolute sensation. Um, can you tell me who... who these two are. We've uh, got the rickshaw driver there, but these are the two I'm interested um, this in. This is George Philip, as, as far as I know, and his good lady. Right. The interesting thing is they've actually gone the whole hog. They've gone native. Yes, they have. They've actually dressed up as a Japanese and a Japanese lady. Do you think the Japanese therefore had these camera studios rather like you can get in Disney World? They most certainly did. And this uh, photograph takes us to this fellow here. Right. So you're uncertain about the date. Well, I'm going to say that from this and from the story you've told me, I'm going to put him somewhere around the 1900. Could right. even be as late as 1910. Okay. Would, would that still make sense? Oh, yes. Yeah? Very much so, yes. Right. Well, let's, yes. Have, let's have a close look at him. We want to look at his tummy. And that's the mark. That's the foundry mark. Right. of this big cat. My goodness, he's a chunk. Quite a weight, which is why I needed a bit of help getting him here today. The, the man who made this took real pains to get these beautiful stripes into the, uh, into the tiger. Look at those beautiful bronze stripes all the yes. way. Mm. So this is a wonderful patina, but the modelling is so stunning on this, isn't it? You can feel the muscular power mm. of those yeah. shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. And then the whiskers swept back. I mean, this is a tiger you wouldn't want to get onto the wrong side of. So is the lump of rock of gold worth more than the tiger? Whichever, I prefer him. You prefer the tiger? Oh, yes, most definitely. Uh, if you were selling him, you would get somewhere between one and a half and two and a half thousand pounds for him. To me, the only value they've got is because they've come down from my ancestors. Yeah. And this... I'd never sell them. And this is where it all started. It, it is indeed, yeah. Gold. Order of industrial heroism. Now, I have to say this is a, this is a new order to, to my knowledge. Um, 
Tell me a bit about it. Well, it was instituted by the Daily Herald mm. in 1923, <laughs> and then it finished when the Daily Herald finished in 1964. Now, the Daily Herald, I, I know a bit about the Daily Herald, that, that really was quite a, a socialist newspaper, yes, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. And I think it, the medal had the nickname of the Workers' VC. Um, and not that many were awarded, and quite a lot of them, of course, were awarded posthumously. But here it says it was presented as a mark of um, respect and admiration to Lewis Phillips. Yes, my father. Presumably this is the, this is the medal. That is the medal, yes. Let me put my glasses on and have a look at that. And a very fine piece of design that is, isn't it? Yes. Picture of uh, Christ on the shoulders of St Christopher. Christopher. I have to ask, what was the act of heroism? He saved a man's life underground in Britannia Colliery in the Rumley Valley. Mm. And um, uh, there's a letter there from the man whose life he saved. Oh. But my father, I was only 13 when my father died, and he never ever spoke about it. And my mother kept all this, but didn't say an awful lot about it. And I would really like somebody out there to be able to tell me exactly what the act of heroism was. All I know is he saved a man's life underground. And there the mystery and there ends. I don't know any more. And this is the a letter, letter from, from the person he yes, saved? Yes, from Dick Shepherd. Can I read it? Yes, certainly. Dear friend, words cannot express my thanks towards you for saving my life. I have thought of you continually uh, since I have been here. My God, I shudder to think what would have happened if you had not been there. Well, I don't want to think any more about it. Do you know Lou? Lou is, was your, your father. Yes. Um, do you know Lou? I have been through the torment of hell with pain, but I'm glad to say I'm quite relieved today. I have a terrible gash along my arm from elbow to armpit and my body is black with bruises, my goodness. But he does, he ends it. Um, I can't write much more now. I feel a bit tired. Give my kind regards to Wilf and Collins and the boys. And, the boys, yes. and that's from Dick, yes. from Richard. Yes. Yes. What an extraordinary memento to have. Mm. Yes, very moving, actually. A absolutely. Very and, moving. And, and what, where does the biscuit barrel fit into well, that? <laughs> when they had the presentation ceremony yes. and the industrial editor of the Daily Herald came and presented the certificate and the medal, yes. um, Dick Shepherd presented my father with this biscuit barrel as a token of gratitude. Yes. But and you think this is 1933 and a man who worked underground wouldn't be earning very much. I should imagine, I mean, this is EPNS, I know, yes. but I would imagine possibly uh, the colliery itself or something like that, put some money towards it. I, I wouldn't have thought he could personally have ever have afforded to buy something I like would that. Have, I would agree with that. But, this is a um, very stylish... It's never, ever been used. My mother's always kept the medal in the biscuit it, <laughs> Um As far as the monetary value is concerned, <laughs> hundred pounds or so yes. but that is not That's the not issue the, the issue is yes. that individual act of bravery mm. the extraordinary oh heartfelt letter mm. from the person that your dad mm. saved and the mystery about actually exactly what, what it was yeah good luck yeah thank you very much thank you do you know in a sense you fulfilled one of my great dreams because as a railway enthusiast what I long to see on the roadshow are nameplates and, of course, no-one ever brings them in because, A, they're very heavy. Yes. And, B, everybody like you, who is, I assume, a railway enthusiast, knows exactly what they are. When did you buy it is the key question. I was in the army. We were serving in Malaya. And my father uh, wrote to me and said that an uncle who I knew, uh, who worked for Great Western Railway and then Western Region, had access to some Great Western Railway engine nameplates. This was in 1964-5. Right. In due course, he contacted me and said, you've got Shakenhurst Hall, and it's cost you 25 quid. Right. And um, it, it was a, a lovely thing to have. Yes. It was a memento, if you like, of steam locomotives. This comes from a Great Western Railway Hall-class locomotive built in 1929, scrapped in 1963, and I think there were 330, is it, locomotives Correct, in yes. the class? Yes, and all they were named. All named yes. halls of Great Britain. They were all over the place. And... Do you have it on the wall? Yes, indeed. It's mounted on the it's mounted yes. boats and things on the wall at the end of our hall, opposite the front door. So, so you're allowed to do that? 
Um, yes, she'd been great. My darling wife been a great supporter. She who must be obeyed has, 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 has approved. Yes, very it, supportive. Yes. Oh, very good. No, no difficulty. Encouraged me, and it's a little railway enclave. In the <laughs> little, little GWR corner. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. yes. Very good. Now here we have it. So you've got a photograph of it at least. Yes, and this is Swin is outside Swindon Works, supposedly um, after it just being built. Right. So it's new at that point. New, new at that point. The key thing is, of course, ex-locomotive condition, no repainting, no. and you haven't done any of that. No. Now, I'm going to turn this game the other way around. What do you think it's worth? Um, well, at a specialist auction, a specialist railway owner um, auction, on a good day, six to eight thousand pounds. I should say, I'm amazed. No. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Heart attack. No. I agree with you entirely. But I think the world record for a nameplate is something like £54,000. I didn't and, know that. Which is an A4 Pacific. Ah, right. Um, a Gresley. But I don't think we'll ever get those sums again. No. I think, you know, those were the heady days when there were still plenty of people with money who wanted these things. I think I would say, you know, if you've got your... If you're going to sell your hall-class nameplate, think about doing it pretty soon. <laughs> if, you're thinking about, if you're thinking about investment. Yes. But if you're just loving it, it doesn't matter at all. Yes, I love it. But it's, a, it's one of these curious markets which is all going to change over the next few years. When we are gone, who's going to worry about it? Yeah, that's right. I think, that, I so, think that's just right. But I, at the same time, I wish I had it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It belongs to my mother-in-law and she says it would belong to her great grandmother mm -hmm. has come down through the family. Um, she can't be here today because she's on holiday, oh. but she wants me to find out from you whether it's worth keeping as a brooch or whether she should split it up for the grandchildren as rings. And what do you think about that? I'm horrified. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be like bulldozing a beautiful house to get the bricks Sorry. out. No, it'd be really, really the most terrible thing um, because it is beautifully phrased and beautifully designed and, and it's a miracle of craftsmanship, actually. Beautiful. And, and, beautiful. and where the fresh air is is part of its charm. I yeah. mean, the diamonds are hugely important, yes. but also the fact that it is open work seems to make it very delicate and light. It's almost like a snowflake, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, beautiful. And it's gold, fronted with platinum, in what we call meal grass settings, which means a thousand grains. And you can see this funny serrated look to yeah. the diamonds there. Yeah. Because this is made in 1900, and it was a time when versatility in jewellery was never greater. And that you, when given a tiny jewel like this, it might be almost the jewel of the lifetime for somebody. They could wear it in their hair, they can wear it as a pendant, they can wear it as a brooch. And does she wear it? She's never worn it. She keeps it in a drawer. Yes. And the only time my husband's grandmother wore it mm -hmm. that she can remember was at our wedding. Oh, well, it's not getting enough airing, is no, it? I don't know what I'm going to do about that. That's rather a sort of family <laughs> problem, isn't it? Which I think I won't enter because it sounds dangerous. <laughs> well, anyway, what will happen when she comes back from holiday? We'll both be in trouble, won't we? <laughs> you will be, anyway. <laughs> I will probably escape. Anyway. Also, it's all your fault. <laughs> yes, do. Go ahead. And, um, no, it's brilliant. And and um, and we might pull her back from, from, from this madness by telling her that um, if she wanted to buy it again, it would cost two and a half thousand pounds. Really? She might like it a bit more now. I think she will. I think that'll attune her sensibilities, as they say. Do I always love these travelling communion sets. In fact, I, I actually call them the, the Vicar's Emergency Response Kit. Well, in one sense, yes, that's true, although there are people who are housebound. To of course. Who one would take communion on a regular basis. Right. And right. I've used this for that. Over Wonderful. The years, so you're yes. actually using it yourself? Yes, yes, I'm Wonderful. a priest. So, ah. yeah. Now, underneath here we've got an interesting inscription. Where are we? Presented to the Reverend Edward Jones. And we've got a date of 1848. Who's That's the right. Reverend Jones? Well, the Reverend Edward Jones was my great great uncle, and it was left to my aunt, who, when I went into the ministry, which was in 1970, um, she then gave it to me. And wonderful. I've used it since then. Oh, I think that, that is wonderful, because these pieces, they, they have been consecrated, yes. and it is so right that they be used. That's right. The date, the period of it, of course, is very much the mid-19th century. And it's rather lovely. If you look at this, 
when you look at the shaping, we've got Gothic Revival there. Yes. And just have a look at that window that we've got over there. Right behind the, there, yes. 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 You see, it's exactly same the same yes, shape. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's where these designs were coming from. Yes, and that's, that little flagon, of course, is where you put the wine. And did you realise the maker's mark that we've got there? This was actually made by angels. No. <laughs> Where were well, they? Were they Liverpool as well? No, they were a London firm. Oh. And um, the firm of angels, which I think is wonderful That's for gorgeous. a communion That's set. Lovely. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? It's beautifully made, though, isn't it, really? Oh, it is it's wonderful. And it's, it's, of course, the fact it's in its original case yes. has helped it to survive. But um, get down to the awful question of value. Yes. A set like this, I would expect to be selling around £400, £500. Not and so. you'd need to insure it, obviously, from more like yes. 750, yes. that sort of level, to make sure you're properly covered. Yes. But thank you so much for bringing it in. Thank you very much. Well, here we are in these wonderful historic surroundings, and it's lovely to see an equally fantastic piece of uh, historic furniture. Um, I understand it hasn't come too far. In fact, it's almost still at home, isn't it? Well, it is almost at home. We don't actually e eat out in the garden, but um, <laughs> uh, we have it in our kitchen um, in a medieval house, and Marvelous. it's used every day for everything, really. It's our storage unit. Well, it, that immediately brings to mind, in actual fact, that although this is, a, is a, an old piece of furniture, it's actually come back to life. You're using it now in the same way that it was first used back in about 1630, 1640. Right. Its description would be a Charles I period court cupboard in oak, because the main body of the whole piece of furniture running through and all the way through the, the doors and the drawers is oak, mm -hmm. including the, the turnings and all the panelling. And then you look closely, and we've got the Dutch influence at that time, which is bringing in some pine uh, timber here in the inlay work, and then we've got the bone and mother of pearl being used as, as detail. And that's very much sort of reminiscent of, 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 the, of the style that came over that period. And I mentioned court cupboard. Most people think that court cupboard is a piece of furniture made for the court. It, it, it wasn't. It was made to go in exactly the same surroundings it, it is with you today. Court is a, is a modern, and I say modern, sort of modern English uh, derivation of short, which is old English. When this was made, they were talking about a short cupboard as opposed to a tall cupboard. And so that's why it's this height. And cup board, you have your board, which is the table, in the middle of your kitchen, just as they did then. And the board, you took the cup, cups from the cupboard and put them on the board. And that's where that comes from. Because, in fact, our ceilings are quite high. Exactly. As you, so I mean, your medieval ceilings are going to be much higher than those that would have been seen in houses of this period. But still, they're a lot higher than we have today. And we mentioned this, these wonderful details in here. These are absolutely charming, these figures that come through. Looking here, this is, we've got new bits of timber. There's certain, this is probably Victorian timber brought in here. And these handles have been replaced at some point. Mm -hmm. So in about sort of 1850, something like that, it had its second age. Second life. And then I would, when did you, when, when did you buy it? When, we bought it about 20 years ago Okay. Um, from a West Country dealer. Um, and it has been in use every day and all day. I mean, it's, it's got cornflakes in that end and jam and chutneys in this end. <laughs> you, you bought it a little while ago. What, what, what sort of money did you pay for it? Well, I fell in love with it and I thought, this is just mad and wonderful. Um, and so I did pay it somewhere into the late, uh, the upper, upper hundreds. The market has changed over 20 mm, years. And yes, uh, you right. can actually see in certain categories that in that 20 years, the price has stayed about the same. Mm. But if I was to say that if you were to try and buy this again today and it, you you would struggle to, to find such a piece in actual mm. fact um, you would have to be paying in the region of two to two and a half thousand mm. oh, that's... well and that's I'm a sure dear old friend absolutely <laughs> and it is so charming to think that after all those years it is enjoying the same life that it was it was designed and made for in the first place thank well, you very much thank you very much I've always wanted to see a picture by this man I knew he existed GF Harris it's a fairly ordinary winter's landscape with a man returning home. But I happen to know who his grandson is, and so do you. Yes. And I see you've brought a letter with you, and there's our clue. Do you know who it is yet? It's Rolf Harris. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote to him. Yeah, actually, my mother wrote to him. Yeah. And he says, yes, it was my, my um, grandfather. And his grandfather actually owed my grandparents some money when they lived in Cardiff okay. before they were moving to Australia. And they couldn't pay. So they offered us for 
oil paintings, one of my grandparents, each of them, and two other oil paintings as well. Fantastic. And how nice for Rolf to sort of recognise yes. that. Yeah. It's quite interesting because, you know, the old artistic genes, how they go through mm. the family to yes. him. Yeah. And, of course, he's now a very yes. well-established artist. In fact, dear old Rolf's work's worth a lot more than his grandfather's. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that little drawing on there, I suppose that might be worth a couple of hundred pounds. Oh. <laughs> um, the picture uh, by uh, G.F. Harris, who's a typical Victorian artist, is worth probably three to five hundred pounds. That's all. And if it was by Rolf, it'd be worth five thousand plus. Yes, but I still enjoy it. And a good painter. Well, if we were doing the Antiques Roadshow 100 or 150 years ago, this would have been a star item. Well, it, it wouldn't, because it would still have been buried in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, an object like this would have been regarded as a very significant antique, an antiquity. Yes. What's your story? Well, I found it, uh, it was found on my farm in South Oxfordshire about 35 years ago. And it was just on the surface of the ground. And it was being ploughed? It uh, was being ploughed. Uh, been ploughed for hundreds of years. Yes. Um, but it still somehow escaped destruction. And what have you found out about it since then? Well, a friend of mine uh, did a paper on it. Probably the flint came from Scandinavia. Yes. Um, it could be 125 million years old, the flint. Yes. Not, not the axe head. No, no. And the axe head itself could be up to 30,000 years okay, old. Okay, right. Okay, well, first of all, we've, we've established that this is the oldest object that will have been brought in today, because it's going to be difficult for the paintings department to beat something <laughs> that's 125 million years old. That's right. Second, we've established that it was worked by a man, and it would have been yes, a man, yes. uh, sometime, according to your friend, up to maybe 30,000 years ago. Yeah. This, this little object would have been one of the most um, crucial things for a gentleman to have in his cabinet of curiosities uh, up until the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we'd been doing a roadshow in the late 19th century, people would be standing with stuffed animals, uh, objects of natural history, yeah. um, lumps of meteorite, and prehistoric yeah. tools, because mm. these were considered very, very collectible. Mm. They were highly sought after. Now, you think it's Scandinavian flint? So, so he imagines, yes. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm, I'm going to say yes. Mm. I've just come back from Copenhagen, mm. my old haunt in the galleries at the, the National Museum, and I've seen cabinets full of these. Yeah. The fact is there was a roaring trade from Scandinavia yeah. in the New Stone Age, that's mm. to say what we call the Neolithic, yeah. um, sending objects like this from Scandinavia all over the place, mm. notably to, to, to Britain. What they have done is they have created a very, very substantial <laughs> tool, yes. which may either have been used as an axe or uh, a shape that is also used as a blade Oh, for on a plough. Hoeing the ground, yes. And, uh, and I suspect that's what this was, because you oh. find them in very... Sometimes they come really, really long lengths. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very skillful flint napping. Yeah. And then as the working end of this tool gets roughened by being ploughed, um, they, 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 they nap it further, so they yeah. get shorter and shorter and shorter. Mm. But that is still a serious working well, length. That, that's interesting. Yes. So not 30,000 mm. years old. I would say that that was probably napped sometime around four... 5,000 years BC. Yeah. So it's still the yeah. oldest <laughs> object that we're going to be showing on the Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. And it's lovely to remind people that the objects we show on TV may themselves one day be out of date as collectibles. Mm. Who knows? These might come back in. At the moment, you can buy one of these for a relatively oh, small amount of money. Very little, yes. Um, it costs you nothing. No, it costs me nothing, but, <laughs> uh, but it's not for sale. <laughs> it's not for sale. Well, um, on today's market, you could buy something like this for maybe £200? More than I thought. I, I, I would have thought 100 to 150 But come back in 100 years' time, <laughs> and who knows? Then I shall be almost as old as a flint, <laughs> We 
we've managed to prize away our book man, Clive Farrahan, not just from his queue, but also from poking around the cathedral. And Clive, you brought along two objects which are treasured by you, which you would rescue from the flames if you had to. Now, tell me about this one first of all, because it, lo it looks like you've taken it off the cathedral roof. <laughs> are you accusing me of having been knocked well, it off? Well, I hope you haven't. Tell me about certainly it. Certainly not. There's been a lot of restoration at Wells, but uh, this is certainly not part of it. This I found in a, an antique shop in Bath, and it is the pediment of either a, a, some sort of spire or off a monument, um, and it is perpendicular, Gothic, and I'm very keen on Gothic architecture. I love churches, I love cathedrals, and this is the late flowering of Gothic in the for, between 1450 and 1550. So it's a, just a wonderful piece. And I know you were a, a schoolboy or a choir boy when you at Westminster. A chorister. So, a chorister. So this brings back memories of that, I imagine, as well, doesn't I it? I suppose it does. As I say, I've always loved looking at uh, churches, and I remember when I was courting my wife, I used to take her out for tea on Saturdays, but first we had to go and visit one of the famous Somerset churches. Very sexy. Such a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about your other object, a book, which makes more sense in a way. Well, yes, I suppose I had to bring in a book, but I didn't want to bring in, you know, just a, a fantastic book. I wanted to bring a book um, that meant something to me and also to my days at the choir school. And this is the first edition of the memoirs of Field Marshal Montgomery. And here's a picture of him on the back. And a picture of his signature, Montgomery of Alabain, FM. And why does this bring back memories for you of, of your days at Chorister? Then? Well, when I was working in London as managing director of, of a bookshop, somebody came in with this letter, and it is a Monty letter, uh, from the Field Marshal, the Viscount Montgomery of Alabain. There we are. It's dated um, 8 12 53. Well, I was at the choir school a little later than that, but not so much later than that. And he's writing to somebody who sells television sets. My dear Quo, he always dropped his R's, I want to give a television to the boys of Westminster Abbey Choir School. And I take great interest in the school and give them a tea and conjurers every Christmas. Could the EEC let me have a shop soiled? or second-hand set on which I would not have to pay purchase tax? Or would they let me have a new set at cost price? I can't afford to pay more than about £50, which was a lot of money in those days. But that's absolutely wonderful, because we used to have this television set. Oh, you, you, so when you were at the school, the television set was, was there. there? And this television set, we were allowed two hours a week to watch the television set. <laughs> so we'd all pile in at five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon after Evensong, and we'd wait for a quarter of an hour while the valves warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> and the pre prefects used to turn it off at six o'clock, absolutely just like that. And the same on Sunday. So we got three quarters of an hour each day. And was it any good as a telly once it had warmed up? It was dreadful. <laughs> it had a sort of a green picture, you know, one of those sort of dreadful green pictures. Anyway, the headmaster, <laughs> many years later, uh, towards the end of my career at the choir school, purchased a television set with the, which they used to put on top of the old television, because it was one of those big um, wooden things. And we used to watch it and we'd get our full hour of television. And when Monty turned up to give us a conjurer and a party at Christmas or whatever, we used to have put had television away and put his in pride of place. As if that was the one you always watched? Of course. <laughs> what a great story. Thank you so much. This looks like a very humble Staffordshire plate, and in effect, that's exactly what it is. But there's a little cartouche on the front of it with a little explanation which says, British Antarctic Expedition, Terra Nova. Now, for me, instantly, that says one thing, and that's Scott of the Antarctic. And the Terra Nova was an important ship. It basically would have supplied them, uh, dropped off everything that they needed in order to, to obviously get on with the expedition. If we turn it over, there's an inscription on the back of it as well, which is typed and stuck on at a later date. And what it says is, Captain R.F. Scott landed from his ship Terra Nova and reached South Pole 18th of Jan 1912, but had been forestalled by Admanson. This plate was carried to Pole and found in tent with Scott, Wilson and Bowers, who had died the 29th of March, Evans and Captain Oates having died previously. Williamson of Relief Party gave this to Bargent. Now, in reading that, I am just kind of completely stupefied and incredulous about this object. Did Captain Scott hold this plate? I, I mean, it opens up an incredible kind of sense of emotion. Um, we all know the story of Scott, um, about how he struggled to get to the pole. 
and Amundsen beat him there um, and how they died. Can, I, I need to know from you what you know about it and how you acquired it. Well, the only thing I know was given to me mother uh, about, well, nearly 60 years ago. Right. By some people she used to work for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got in, uh, the daughter's boyfriend got in touch with the museum up in Cambridge. And right. They give us the uh, information on Williamson. Right, OK. Williamson, who was in the relief party or heading the relief party, found Scott uh, in the tent. And I think what is also safe to say is that the things that were taken away that came out of the tent are fairly, really well known and documented, in fact. And as far as I know, there is no mention of ceramics coming out of the tent. What is strange for me is that to think that actually Scott actually may have handled this plate, perhaps on the Terra Nova it was put in front of him. How do you prize something that's that special, that emotive, and almost, you know, associated with something so important in, in British history? Well, I don't know where to go on the value, so I'm just going to take an, an absolute punt on this. I'm going to have to put five to seven thousand pounds on, because to me it is a really important object. Amazing. Thank you very much for bringing this along. Thank you. Two very different objects, a Huntley and Palmer's biscuit tin. I mean, lovely, isn't it? With a fabulous collection of buttons, I presume that all goes down to the bottom, yes. and a bronze. Now, yes. I'm very lucky to have these two very different <laughs> things to be talking about, but I'm hoping that there is a link between the oh, two. Yes. OK, they please are tell her, me. They are her collection. She being my mother. And One. if anybody remembers the suffragette doll on the roadshow... <coughs> well, I uh, certainly no. do, because I filmed it. Yeah. What, what is the link with the suffragette doll? The suffragette was her adoptive mother. But her adoptive mother, then, if I remember about the suffragette doll, was incarcerated. Oh, yes. So what happened to Ma while her adoptive mother was put away in, in clink? Um, as far as I can remember from the tales told, um, there were a sister who looked after them. So <coughs> your mum here, yep. um, she was from a good family and so presumably they could afford to have a well-known sculptor um, <laughs> recreate her in bronze. Do yes. we know... There we are. That's what we found in Monk's mum's papers. Well, he looks just as a sculptor should look, doesn't he? Absolutely. Uh, he's, he's, like a, he's like a sort of um, caricature of a sculptor yes. with his great bristling moustache and wearing his floppy bow tie and so on. Um, is the, there's a date on the back, too. And there's a date on the back which says August the 15th, 1912. 1912. Mummy was 12. She was 12. And, oh, very nicely on the back here, we have very nicely written, Paul R. Montford. And I think that is Raphael, isn't it? Paul Raphael Montford. Yes. Um, he studied at the Lambeth School and also at the Royal Academy mm -hmm. Schools. And he was, um, he was recognised. I mean, he wasn't in the first flight of sculptors, no. but he uh, was working up until 1938. But his latter career was in Australia. And in fact, he died in Australia. Um, and there are a number of monuments in Australia by Montford. So here we have Mum, aged 12, and when did Mum start collecting the buttons? She inherited them from her mother's companion, who was a great friend of the family afterwards. And a, a huge mixture of styles and dates and so on. I'm just going to pick out a few of these. Um, I mean, we've got sort of Sèvres style Yes. porcelain buttons here, um, some Ruskin buttons, um, yes, quite. and this, this one actually is yes. stamped Ruskin, not, Mar, all not all of them are. Not all of them are, Then those we can date very happily to the end of the um, last century, perhaps into the beginning of the 20th century. These are Liberty buttons, little silver Liberty buttons with a piece of turquoise in each centre, mm. embroidered buttons, enamelled, shell, a fabulous mixture, and even coming through here to um, early perspex and yes. plastics. Now, we need to talk about value, really. 
Well, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it's actually, it's not as difficult as you might imagine. The buttons are more of a problem because, of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg with the buttons. Yes, you have is. got dozens and dozens, dozens and dozens and dozens. So all that I can say with the buttons is that they are worth varied amounts of money of course. from about 50p each up to probably... Eight, ten, twenty pounds each, depending Ouch. depending on what they are. However, what I will say about this fabulous bronze, if she ever did come up for sale, she would be hugely uh, fought over. Um, I would say that uh, the auction value today would be perhaps two and a half thousand pounds. I think she's absolutely glorious, mm. and uh, I'm very pleased that she's come here through you to tell her story. I'm always fascinated by inscriptions on pieces. And what have we got here? Presented to Thomas Gripper, Esquire, by 258 of his fellow townsmen. And that was in December 1830. So who was Thomas Gripper? Well, he was my great-great-grandfather. Sometimes I get mixed up thinking he was my great-grandfather because they had the same name. Right. He was, in fact, the great-great. So, what was he actually given uh, this for in 1830? Well, he was uh, quite an important person in the town. He was the chief magistrate, and he put a lot of work into getting the independent representation, i.e. getting them an MP. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. Um, other shapes, usual waffle in those days, <laughs> yes. about good works, etc. Yes, it's saying and, he was a um, splendid fellow, he yes, was. Yes, splendid fellow, yes. <laughs> Basically, it was for getting an MP for the town of Hartford, of Hertfordshire. Right. And what is fantastic here, though, is what you've brought along with it. Yes, we have this scroll, or a piece of parchment, which used to be properly rolled up and was much now faded, which lists the 258 no. people who subscribed to buy this, and they were only allowed to pay five shillings each in order that no, nobody should feel that they couldn't afford to do it and um, you know, opt out. Isn't that Therefore, wonderful? they got as much money as they could at five bob a bash. Hmm? That, that is tremendous because... If we made ten bob, we'd have had a bigger salver. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And five shillings was actually a fair old amount of money anyway. It was, yeah. So normally that's what you get, but you don't get that. I don't ever remember seeing one like that before. Yeah. So let's have a look and see what's going on at the back here. Now, the marks. There's quite a maker's mark to find. Paul Storr one of the most famous, one of the most important of all the makers ever in this country. But then we've got here the date letter for 1799 to 1800. Mm -hmm. There is something seriously wrong. And what is seriously wrong is that you would never find anything of this design in 1799-1800. What's happened? I suspect they've taken, it may have been a tray, it may have been a large salver, could even have been a meat dish that had been made by Paul Storr and hallmark everything correctly at that time. They've reshaped the edge, they've added all this decoration, they've added all this chasing, they've added these handles, and they've added these feet and didn't send it back to the assay office. No. Now, that's where it gets naughty. Because, as it is, it actually technically, I would suggest, has no value no. other than scrap. What really needs to happen is that it needs to be sent to the Antiques Plate Committee uh, in Goldsmiths Hall in the City of London and then have it bought within the law. And this, with additions marks on it, assuming they agree with what I've suggested, then it would acquire a value as well. I would suggest you'd be looking in excess of £2,000. How much would it cost to have it re-stamped? Uh, to send to Goldsmiths Hall, there's no charge. I mean, other than the postage or going on the train to yeah. take it in, because the company very rightly work on the principle. They do not wish to discourage people from having pieces bought within yeah, I the law. That. Would it be much better, in fact, if they paid two bob each and kept the full store tray? That <laughs> would indeed have been much better. You are absolutely spot on in that respect, and it would be worth significantly more would, yeah. if that had been the case. 
At first sight, this is a pretty gloomy object. It's not clear what it is, it's had a very hard life, and you may well wonder why are we bothering with something like this, but the secret, of course, is all inside. Yeah. And if we open it, spectacular things are revealed. Now, what do you think it is? Well, it was in my wife's side of the family. It's been there for many years, and it was believed to be a Napoleonic prisoner of war who made it. And I'm not at all sure whether this is right or not. Well, I think you've hit it absolutely right. What we're looking at is straw work. All this decoration is done with very carefully cut and stained pieces of coloured straw. It was made in 1810, 1805, you know. A lot of them were sailors, and the land battles weren't relevant. It was people captured off those ships at Trafalgar or where, wherever. And that's why they had those sort of maritime skills and that patience that came from hours and hours and hours of sitting on decks with not much to not do. Much. And not much to do converted into this. And having made pieces like this, they would then have regular stands in the local marketplace. And the money they could earn from selling their craftsmanship improved their lives. You know, they could buy extra food, they could buy clothes. They could lead a normal existence while remaining confined within the prison area. Yes. And I love this because for the first time, I've seen something that is absolutely pristine. Not in condition, it's a, it's a wreck in many ways. Yes. Everything is just spectacular in terms of the colour. This, this zigzag pattern is how we were meant to see it. And if you take out the drawers, you know, you get wonderful green and white stripes inside. So seeing this when you opened it, I just thought, my yes. God, what a wonderful vision of how it was. So, what's it worth? Well, what do you think? Oh, £100, I don't know. OK, here you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... It's hard to price because it is in one way so spectacular, in another way it's a wreck. But to see one like this, as they should be, I'm going to say £3,000. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> but find me another. Ah, yes. You know, yes. that has this lovely colour. Yes. Spectacular object, thank you. Well, this brooch was given to me by an elderly lady in 1967. I understand it's a black opal. Um, I don't know its origin. She was from Belgium. Um, I used to wear it in my early 20s. Did you? On Fair. my lapel. It's curious enough, it's not a, an opal, it's in its entirety. But here, little fragments of, of opal have been set into what's called shellac, which is an organic sort of fixative, really. And, and, um, but they are slivers of opal, and they have all the same properties which is to refract the light and break it up into a rainbow, really. And so it has all the charm of oil on water or something like that, or indeed a rainbow. And we can say with absolute certainty that it's, it's over 100 years old. It's probably about 120 years old. Um, and, and, and I suppose there is a double meaning here. One of them is obvious that the snake is sort of guarding the precious stones. He's a guardian of the treasure, which I quite like. But actually, it's probably more complex than that because the snake in antiquity was a symbol of, of eternity. It's called the Ouroboros, the eternally renewing circle, the snake right. swallowing his tail, which he effectively does here. Okay. And it's always been a, a symbol of eternal love. And so I love this thing. And how much do you love it? Well, I keep it because my daughter, actually, it's her um, birthstone, and I hope that one day she might enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed it. Yes, lovely um, story. I and mean, that's what jewellery is all about. And um, I think probably, well, £800 today, something like that. Oh, <laughs> she might enjoy it more now. <laughs> I don't know. I love it, I don't care. I think it's fantastic. Of course, very few people will need introduction to this artist, Heath Robinson, William Heath Robinson. I mean, he's given his name to a dictionary description for a contraption or mad model. Mm -hmm. You know, all those amazing sort of contraptions for beating the Hun. I just love those things. But um, this is a little known side of him, really, isn't it? This is his pure illustration work. Mm -hmm. We've got one here for boys stealing eggs. Do you know, I don't really like it very much. Do you no, mind me saying that? No, 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 you're welcome. It's just, it's just his head's a bit large. <laughs> yeah, a bit different to his um, beanets up the Germans, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, a bit <laughs> yeah. different, yeah. Yes. Um, but I love this one, this pen and ink drawing here. That is absolutely enchanting. What a pretty girl. Yeah. And there's a beehive, and goodness knows what those bees are doing, but she's holding some flowers. Um, I think that's a really pretty and slightly mad drawing, mm. lovely, very decorative. And that line of his is so, so delicate. It's, he, you know, when I see something like this, 
from Heath Robinson. I think he's almost as good as Aubrey Beardsley, mm -hmm. who was actually a fairly close contemporary, would yeah. you believe it? Yeah. Uh, how did you get them? Um, many years ago, about in the 60s, I was invited to modernise an old property for a very prominent artist, his family and his wife. And um, they moved on, they parted, and the wife, with her new partner and family, moved to a dilapidated property on a wealthy estate. And they were finding it hard times to make this property work, and I was the builder for them. The day of reckoning comes when money is needed to pay the bills, and I were off offered these in part payment and took them gratefully many years ago. Did you like them then? I liked them then. I always mm. admired them. I think this is why they were offered to me. Oh, I see. Yes. You particularly liked these. I, yes, I did. They mm. were wonderful. Which is your favourite? Because there are two this here. This one. Well, I must admit, it's mine too. Yeah. I think that is absolute heaven. It's actually. got his full name on it as well. And yes. The others are just initials. That does help in a sense. Yes. Uh, it's obviously an illustration for something, but I couldn't think in my own mind quite for what. Uh, he did, did illustrate a few of Kipling's poems, and I suppose it might be for one of those. Um, at any rate, it looks to me relatively early in, in Heath Robinson's career. Uh, I don't know, about late 1890s, perhaps. 1900, really? yes, yeah. and like that. But it is so delicate. I mean, look at the, the musculature and the, the shading yeah. under her armpit and on her skin. It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely ravishing. And I think the hands are really they sensitively are. done. Are. The arms and the hands, yes. What a beautiful, beautiful picture, yeah. achingly romantic. A rather strange face on this one. I'll explain that. Well, she's a perky little number as yeah. well. I mean, you know, <laughs> quite often they do relate to texts and you need the text to go with it. I like her sort of rather frazzled hair. Yeah. Um, she looks like a sort of nibbled end of a pencil or something, doesn't she? <laughs> uh, I love that cloak as well, drawn yeah. tight around her in a sort of slightly Red Indian way. Yeah. I mean, there's such, there's such cleverness here in visual terms. I love the way it's made into this shape with the, with the bush behind. And everything is quite sculptural about it. Mm. Do, do, do you mind me being cheeky and asking how much the builder's bill was? Um. Well, Itch. I think that's between me and her, isn't it? <laughs> well, fair but, enough. Uh, that's yeah. me knocked back, and you're quite right. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. No, it was substantial, but um, yeah. I was happy, and we walked away friends at the end of the day. Good. Well, should we start, say, with this one, one I don't like? <laughs> right. Although, you know, that's still going to be wanted by a collector, I would have thought, uh, up to a thousand pounds. Really? Yeah. So, wow. so it's only a black and white yeah. thing, but. Um, it might be a little difficult to sell. He's not yes. the most commercial no, image. Not but for sale. No, of course not. No. None of them are. But <laughs> no. for insurance, you might yeah. need to. Yeah. Okay. And then this, which I think is just uh, delightful, absolutely delightful. Um, two to three thousand pounds. Really? Yes. Yeah. I know it's only a little, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Um, then we've got these two. Well, um, with added colour and very delicate colour too, as we've said. Um, this one. Probably four or five thousand pounds. Yeah. And then uh, this one, I think, was my, my, my favourite. And uh, I'd be very surprised if it's worth less than, than six thousand pounds. Really? Well, thank you very much. Well, it adds up, doesn't it? You know, yeah. more than ten thousand pounds here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe my wife will let me display them in the front room now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that while the roadshow has been just through that archway there in the Bishop's Palace Gardens, the Palace Croquet Club's been using the lawn here. It was invited to use the lawn by the Bishop 30 years ago with the proviso that they all wear white, just because it looks so lovely. And there are two different types of croquet, golf and association. So you see, it's amazing the things you pick up on the roadshow. We've had a wonderful day here in Wells. Hope you've enjoyed it too. Bye-bye. <laughs>